Our story is one of reimagining. Reimagining who you can be, what you can achieve, and how SEMA can support you. As technology and digital platforms disrupt businesses, we are reimagining what the profession can be. We've updated our syllabus to meet the expectation of employers, ensuring SEMA qualified professionals have the skills to make an impact from day one. Reimagine your career. Contact SEMA Sri Lanka. Welcome to LND TV. This week on Talking Business, Anush and Silvaraja sit with Dr. Rajin Maharuf, consultant in critical care medicine and anesthesia at the John Farman ICU of Addenbrooke's Cambridge University. Welcome to LND TV, Rajin. Good to have you with us. Thank you very much and thanks for having me. How do you view the current situation around the world in terms of managing this pandemic? Uh, with regards to the pandemic, uh, you know, since the first evidence of the new novel coronavirus, uh, SARS-CoV-2, as it came to be known, came to light back in December 2019, in the last 11 months or so, the cases have grown exponentially. And this is an exponentially growing disease is becoming uh, increasingly clear. I remember giving a talk at the end of April to, uh, on a webinar, and at that time, the global cases were 3 million. You can see that the, 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 these are points where the, the cases have been reported. And you can almost make out the whole of the US, India, and, you know, and also the, uh, Europe being ravaged by the coronavirus uh, pandemic that's going on. So the mortality from this is about 2.5, 3.6%. Obviously, you know, there are many unreported cases. This is from what we're doing with the reported ones. For the US, for example, which has a very extensive testing program, have a mortality of the, similar to the global number of 26 to 2.7% mortality, which is terrible from their outcome perspective. So this, as we know, is a highly infectious SARS coronavirus. It is spread by droplets and aerosol. And if you come close contact with someone who is infectious and who's suffering from symptoms, you are likely to catch it. And it depends on the dose of the disease or the virus that they give to you. And that is, a combination of how close you are to them, the proximity, and how long you spend with them, the duration. And the combination of those two factors would amplify your risk of picking up the infection. It enters through your lungs, uh, and obviously people have variable symptoms as a consequence of contracting the disease. Three major symptoms are high temperature, or persistent cough, or loss of taste, or sense of smell. There are sizable majority, the minority, who have a asymptomatic uh, disease as well. And that's a very difficult problem with regards to controlling this disease. So person-to-person -person spread is more likely if you're indoors and it's gonna be increasingly a problem coming into the winter in the, in, in, in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, but uh, people uh, also have documented that this virus can survive uh, in, on surfaces for extended periods of time, depending on the surface, even up to 72 hours. And people who are not opening their posts for that period, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're likely to catch it because just the presence of the virus doesn't mean you're going to get infected by it, especially if the dose is small. So I think that is unnecessary precaution that makes people feel better if they want to do it. Severe COVID is in about 10 to 20 percent of the population who, who are documented, and that means you know people who need uh, hospital support or oxygen and so on. And about a quarter of them, a total of about five percent, end up requiring intensive care support or high dependency, which is going to be a huge burden on resource and management of these patients worldwide. We know that severe disease is more likely, as with time you've got to know the disease, is more likely in people who are elderly, who are males, so you and me are notion, right, to be done for, and um, people who are overweight, who have diabetes, who have high blood pressure, and especially those who have heart disease, and perhaps emerging evidence for those who have kidney disease as well. Interestingly, for a disease that enters through the lung, people with chronic lung problems don't seem to have an increased risk beyond the general population. We know that if, it, if you let this disease rip through society, the mortality will go up. And it goes up because of the provision of, of resource and healthcare will be overwhelmed by the number of cases. They need to be looked after for an extended period of time, especially in critical care. You don't get over this over 48, 72 hour period. So therefore, if you don't have the healthcare staff or the resources to be able to look after, people will die much more than they are doing at the moment. So therefore, this flattening the curve is real. It impacts on survival. And it's really important that everyone does their bit, try to reduce the rapid nature in which this is spread so that if you develop severe COVID, hospitals can look after you, but also that they can look after other people who don't have COVID, with cancer, with heart disease, with strokes, 
whatever else that you need to have as an emergency or as an elective uh, problem. And also the other uh, argument about this uh, uh, whole situation is that the emerging evidence that it produces long-term symptoms, something called long COVID, that uh, people have ongoing symptoms of COVID or chronic fatigue that we know from people get with severe viral illnesses or other things. But COVID seems to produce a, a higher proportion of pay, pay people who get severe viral illness. Therefore, more people suffer from chronic fatigue as a consequence of post viral illness. There are also people who have post ICU syndromes like delirium, disorientation, inability to go back to normal life, family breakup, uh, nightmares, and so on, or even chronic you know, um, shortness of breath, kidney problems on dialysis, or heart issues. So, this is disease is serious and therefore it needs to be treated with such uh, respect as we are doing at the moment, hopefully but most of us. Anyway. As you mentioned, yes, masks are important, but you've also cited the East Asian culture, Razin, whereby uh, wearing a mask is almost routine and they've been able to control the threat somewhat. Could you just elaborate on this? Indeed. Um, I mean, it's one of the easiest and simplest ways to try to effectively and quite significantly uh, impact on the spread of this virus. We know that the spread is affected if you have a good hygiene, you quarantine, able, able to quarantine yourself, if you're symptomatic, you know that you're positive and you're sensible about the way that you behave amongst your family, but also others in society. The transmission between individuals, we know from this paper, especially from the Lancet, that it reduces significantly beyond a one meter distance of physical distancing. People call it, you know, social, distancing or whatever else is in reality is physical distancing. And if you can get up to two meters, it is an even better uh, reduction of risk of transmission. Face masks are pivotal in reducing this spread of this disease. It reduces the, even if you wear a normal mask, it reduces your risk exceedingly well. But also if you're in working in a high risk environment like a hospital, the use of N95 or N99 masks are also very, very effective at reducing its spread. If you combine that with a um, eye protection, uh, test trace and track, uh, isolate um, uh, programs, it becomes even more uh, effective than uh, we are achieving today. I won't touch on the natural herd immunity thing uh, at this moment yeah. in time. However, the, um, we know that the, the communities, the societies that used to use masks for pollution reasons, <clears throat> prior to the pandemic, right, have um, suffered this much better than those who are not used to using it normally. Excuse me. Um, the, um, so the countries in Southeast Asia, uh, for example, Singapore, South Korea, China, Taiwan, who have been using masks regularly, and it's part of their inbuilt culture uh, ingrained into them to use that and also distance themselves as part of their culture have fared much better with regards to transmission and the effect from uh, the coronavirus pandemic as opposed to the Western countries who are not used to using masks um, in day-to-day -day life and they see it as a huge inconvenience the way they live. And these are the figures. We know that if someone who is infectious is not wearing a mask, uh, is interacts with someone who wears a mask who's not infected, the risk of transmission is 70%. If you're both not wearing a mask, it's higher than that. It's above 90% risk of infection. If you are infected and you wear a mask, you run a less than 5% of someone else picking up from you. And if you both wear it, it's 1.5% or even less. So it's a significant reduction of your risk. And the ability to go back to normal life, therefore, can be easily, not quite you know, manageably because people find it inconvenient, but it's for a simple intervention that is cheap, can make a huge difference to people going back to living a reasonably normal life. So masks are very important. Razin, how is the vaccine going to work when this virus seems to be affecting different people in different ways, some more serious and others uh, absolutely no symptoms? That's a very good question, uh, Anushin. Uh, obviously, you know, we've faced a very difficult problem, you know, and obviously you know, as a human race, we have risen to many challenges. And of course, this is, uh, you know, one of the most difficult ones that will go down in history. And the necessity is the mother of all inventions, as they say, combined with, of course, the virus coming out of China. As I mean, you live in interesting times, the Chinese <laughs> so they, they, they've impart, used to impart on people they didn't like. But we're definitely living in interesting times, and we have a huge necessity to invent, to try to get back to normal life. So vaccine is one possible portal for that. 
And we know that basic vaccine um, technology is that you give a, um, a similar, same germ, but inactivated or in a way that they can't infect you into your body in many different aspects that it can be introduced so that you mount an immune response. It is taken to be foreign, so therefore the body mounts a response and tries to kill it, but also develops a memory so that if you're reintroduced to it later on, you're, the body is able to try to detect and, and fight it. There are, um, in the US, for example, to talk about a program, the platform that has been used is called the Operation Warp Speed, and we've called aptly that because they're trying to condense what is normally a very lengthy process of ensuring, especially the proof of concept, but also safety profile of these vaccines over a period between five to 18 years has been condensed into four months to try to get this into what we call phase three studies. And it's coordinated by very important aspects of the US government, but also the private sector, the pharma. We have four fundamental platforms, and particularly to mention the first two over there, the mRNA and the replication defective live vector are the ones that have been talked about particularly in the media. And then we have these four platforms being given, each of those being given to two companies. So they have eight different groups that are working on this so that even if one was to not work out then the second one to fall back on to see if that is effective. You said, you know, which vaccine may be available it depends on which one produces best results. Now we may all end up with just one type of vaccine that produces the best results out of this, because by they're taking four different known uh, platform approaches to see which one is going to be most effective against coronavirus. And out of these, the particular one that is talked about is, is the Oxford one, which is the AstraZeneca Oxford one, which is the Chadox one, which is using a chimpanzee adenovirus vector, you, you know, uh, led by Sarah Gilbert and Andrew Pollard uh, in Oxford in collaboration with AstraZeneca with us in Cambridge, who seem to be producing good noises and good preliminary data about mounting an immune response. And we know that mounting an immune response is not the easiest of things to do at the moment. We, this is the data from giving different doses of vaccine to the young and the old. And you know, higher the dose of the vaccine that you give, you have a higher immune response. And the young produce a better response than the old. But it is not without consequence because the fact that the side effects that they get, like fatigue, pain, uh, uh, lethargy, headache, whatever else, of tolerating these vaccinations also becomes more difficult the higher the, the dose that you get. So you may need to find some you know, balance between the right dose and being able to tolerate having the vaccine given to you. So if you're being the eternal optimist and want to you know, hang all of your uh, hats on, on getting, the, um, getting a vaccine that is going to be effective, we know that this is an incredible effort that's been put together. The best brains in the business with all of the wealth and the technology and the know-how with uh, governmental help. There is also data sharing between uh, different groups, different countries, big universities, and we have made tremendous progress so far. The initial data is very encouraging. There doesn't seem to be any serious adverse effects so far. So that is useful, even though a couple of trials were halted temporarily, they are back up and running at the moment. But there is also a strict regulatory framework and transparency to see if there's any adverse effects in case you know things have to be uh, rethought in the process. But and we know that there is there will be an update, especially from the um, the Oxford vaccine group in, at the end of November to December. But that's a timeline that's been slipping in and out. So we'll have to keep our eyes on to see when they will be able to update us as to how effective they are. And if it's successful, uh, you know, potential to return to pre-COVID life, which would be fantastic. I, you know, everyone gets vaccinated and then we have some immunity to it, depending obviously, you know, if we can get through the whole of the population. And there's some normality and both with regards to the normal life, but psychological aspect and the economic side of things is going to be unimaginably fantastic if this comes to pass. And hopefully they'll be able to produce this at cost so that even the, the um, not so wealthy countries can benefit from this technology and the whole world will be able to go back to normal and be over this pandemic problems. However, you know, with the good comes the bad, right? And, and from a balanced perspective, you know, you, you know, if you're a pessimist, you, know, you say we've never ever produced a vaccine against an RNA virus. And coronavirus too is an RNA virus. So that's not a fantastic start. Antibody levels we know in people who survived uh, COVID 
uh, you know, it is not sustained. You know, it, it, it ebbs away. Does that mean they lose the immunity or is there a memory if they were reintroduced that they produce another response again? We don't know. However, we do know people who survive uh, COVID may be reinfected with a different strain. You mentioned that before, right? So that, that has been documented. So that doesn't necessarily confer immunity. And these are not people who are previously unwell. They were normal people being infected again with severe COVID and having it twice round. Maybe there's an underlying genetic preponderance for it. We don't know at the moment. We don't know about the other aspect of immunity, which is the T cell response at the moment. And if this you know, immunity is waning, do we need boosters to try to improve the immunity in these groups of people? Does that mean you need to have a vaccination every four months, eight months? How do you do that to 7 billion people around the world? You know, all the logistics of getting it around, the cold chain, making sure it's effective and it's not expired. It's going to be a huge logist logistical challenge. It's not beyond us, but it's not going to be easy. We don't know all the adverse effects that could happen. It will be elucidated with time. We know early uh, reports suggest that it's not too bad, but we've had previous vaccine data that's produced severe neurological problems into three, four years after having vaccines. And warp speed says it is warp speed. You know, we're rushing this through and we're doing this because we want to concentrate on getting back to normal and reducing the impact of the economic and psychological damage of coronavirus pandemic and lockdowns as much as possible, balancing out against protecting people's health. So um, the, the, there are ethical debates about, you know, who should get the vaccine first, and we'll probably have that when we have a vaccine. There's, there's early soundings about it. But what we don't want to feed into is conspiracies like anti-vaxxers who, who are already pessimistic about, you know, vaccines that exist that protect millions of children around the world with the MMR vaccine and polio and so on. And then to use, if we get this wrong, to use this as evidence to say that the whole vaccination program is bogus and conspiracy and some you know, people controlling uh, and the, the world. And we must be cautious when these um, companies report good data, but obviously because turkeys are not going to vote for Christmas and they're getting billions of dollars of money for to produce this. So we said um, this is compressed, five to 18 years of this is compressed into four months. So you can see how easily that things could go wrong. And that would be our normal process of development of these vaccines. And the regulatory framework should make sure that these are adhered to. And we know that even with the drugs that we've known to be safe before, when we've tested them in people, they, certain people have reacted really adversely. And in this trial, for example, in Northwick Park in 2006, we had six people who were in critical care with severe multiple organ failure and lasting damage from drugs that were being trialed at the time. So we'll have to take it in turn and see you know, risk benefit and see how well we can introduce these things into the world. Now, the WHO has said that a vaccine could be ready by the end of the year. But based on what you have said so far, Azim, do you think this is really realistic? I will be very cautious on betting my house on that. Um, because the fact that we know this, this timeline has slipped several times. And of course, they need to keep the governments and the public uh, optimistic and hopeful. And there is a tremendous amount of work being going on. Maybe we'll get some uh, uh, positive mutterings coming through in, uh, on the other side of Christmas and perhaps into spring. There's definitely a program in the UK to see if we can have a mass vaccination program into the spring if a vaccine becomes available start seeing if a vaccine becomes available and if it's effective. We're going for a short break now. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the show as we continue our discussion on the COVID-19 virus with Dr. Razim Maru. Razim, what's your take on the vaccine race? Whom do you think will win? China, Russia, uh, America? We can only go by the published evidence. And uh, most of the published evidence has now come from the, the US trials and also the UK ones that are collaborating with the US. So that is all what we know. There are some that are happening in Australia. China and, uh, and Russia claim to have, or Russia especially had claimed to have a vaccine. And some Chinese say they have a vaccine. I have not really come across it. If they have it, they should share it. There are, there's a huge problem of COVID 
in Russia and lots of deaths coming out of it. They are not got a mass vaccination program, even though Putin's daughter seems to have been vaccinated, according to them. So until you see the data, you don't know if it exists or not, and you just have to accept what they're saying. But in this case, with pessimism, that it is not something that exists. So from the published data, the uh, North America uh, and the UK at the moment is leading the field. That's going to be usable and safe. What about countries with high numbers of asymptomatic cases? Uh, how can you control something when you don't even know that you have it? And that's a great question. But the problem is you don't know what the true denominator of the disease is, because if you don't have an extensive testing program, you don't know what the caseload is. And if you don't have a testing program, you don't know how many people actually die from it. And the U.S. Is, is a good example of, you know, what proportion I actually got it or not, because they have an extensive testing program. So it is difficult to say that you actually have a, a lower mortality in certain countries versus others. But the asymptomatic spread in the, t in, the, in the documented side of things is about 5 to 10% of the total. If you follow simple instructions of preventing this disease, whether you are symptomatic or not, you wear the mask, you distance yourself, and you have good hand hygiene, the risk of transmission, whether you are asymptomatic, COVID or not, is significantly reduced. So therefore, you have an effective way, as long as you have the discipline and, uh, and the compliance to follow that through. Now, most countries are taking the same measures in terms of uh, controlling the outbreak, uh, but um, some countries are more successful than others. What, do you, what is it that you think that they are doing right? Yeah, so Taiwan is a fantastic success story, and they should be congratulated for that. I would probably um, dispute the fact that all governments and countries are doing the same thing. They're doing perhaps generally the same thing in different ways, in rather confusing ways, and uh, different speeds which adds to the chaos in the way that this is being managed. Taiwan and a few other countries probably have gained by their culture that existed before this came to I mean, they were wearing masks for pollution reasons, they were isolating, and they were very compliant with what they were required to do. And we've seen that similarly in Germany. They're very disciplined and compliant, and they've had a fantastic outcome from the numbers that they've, they've had relative to, to other European countries. And I think that plays a huge role in being disciplined and uh, complying with the simple things that can be done to reduce the spread of this virus significantly. And that takes a community effort. You know, um, it, it really is an individual as well as a global problem that everyone needs to, to, to come in. And I know if I pull up a, a little um, um, slide that I have here, right? You know, if you had 90% of your population that are complying with this whole of these uh, efforts that you need to do, even the 10% who don't do it can uh, seem to produce majority of the spread. These super spread events account for most of the spread that happens. So it really needs everyone in society to understand and get behind the action that needs to be done for the good of everyone and the individual. So we must take it seriously. This is therefore public education and confidence is gonna be a key aspect of ensuring that this is effective and work. We've got to realize that lockdowns are only temporary and they're not a panacea. They don't cure the problem. They only delay it so that you can manage the problem. How to manage it is to learn to live with this virus in the absence of a treatment or a, or a vaccine or a cure. We know that dexamethasone works really well in severe COVID. I don't believe that remdesivir is as effective as their people make out to be. We may have a second useful uh, treatment in the future that may be effective. Though if in the absence of those things, we know that these simple things like masks, hygiene, distancing makes a huge improvement to reduction of uh, spread of this virus. And the world, you, may, you mentioned the, the, the governments working in unison. I don't see that. I don't see the four nations within the UK working in unison, providing a, 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 a single message out to the, the Joe public to, to, to comply with. And they are so confused. They don't know what's on this side of Wales or the other side of Wales or in Scotland, you know, what time, you know, how many people are allowed to meet or what time do the pubs close or, you know, which ones in tier two or with three, tier three is utterly confusing and frustrating. And, it's, and I think from a leadership perspective, it's been abject failure from the UK government in that aspect. And it's, it's turning out that this is, has consequences in the way that the second wave is coming through. So I mean, it's just a balance of trying to get the right balance between health and the economy. Uh, as such. We do know 
that you know the devastation of lockdowns is terrible and the restrictions are uh, you know not very good with regards to improving out, uh, outlook for populations but you also remember that health and wealth are closely intertwined and uh, significant health consequences are associated with unemployment and poverty and that you know no one can deny that we also know that dead people are not economically productive it's a fact but severely unwell ones are doubly problematic because of whether they consume resources without also being economically active. And if you want to try to improve this in the long term, you've got to get this right up front. And I'm not sure a lot of people are doing this, especially governments. And economics and health don't operate in isolation. So we need as much an eye on how well to handle this from a health aspect, but also to ensure their societal well-being, mental well-being, economic well-being, is protected to a great extent from what we do. How long do you think it would take for the entire world to fully understand and control this virus? I was looking for my crystal ball earlier. I haven't found it, right? But if I do find it, I'll let you know. Um, in the absence of a vaccine or an effective treatment, you know, if you relay this and you know look at what happened the last time we had a severe pandemic, the Spanish flu of 1918, it went on for three years and 50 million people died, estimated. And, you know, but they had a much longer time between one wave and the other because you didn't have, you know, international air travel as much as we do, et cetera, the population was smaller. So we had about a year between the first wave and the second wave during the Spanish flu. We've got it now, you know, three, four months at the moment before the second wave is now hitting the UK. So the, um, I suspect, you know, if you extrapolate the number of people who need to be infected to reduce the transmission risk according to the natural nature of this virus is about 70%, 65 to 70%. And in the first wave, we think we've had about 6% infection in this country. So we're looking, extrapolating in the UK, according to our data, three to five years, right? In the absence of a vaccine, in the uh, absence of an effective treatment to reduce the risk from, of death, from severe COVID. But it's not just death. We talked about long COVID. There are health consequences, economic consequences of having long-term effects of this illness. So I don't want to put a dampener on things. I really hope we get through something that you know is effective at controlling it. But if you let it you know, go the way that it is going at the moment, with lockdowns and ins and outs and waves, three to five years, unfortunately. As a final question then, Razin, what would be your advice to the general public? Well, I think everyone needs to uh, take this extremely seriously as their own purpose to improve the outcome of their own, as well as the society and the world's uh, outcome from this severe pandemic problems that we have. Please do the basics. Think of this as being your problem and that your role in trying to prevent its spread is absolutely pivotal and vital. Wear a mask if you are out, so, uh, physically distance for at least a meter, and clean your hands. If you have symptoms, isolate. If you come in contact with someone when you have symptoms, ask them to isolate. And if you've got severe symptoms like shortness of breath, uh, dizziness, not making enough urine, et cetera, et cetera, get help from the hospital or some medical professional. In doing all of this, it'll help a great deal to try to prevent the peak effect of this virus and its damage, but also make it a lot quicker to come out of it. And if everyone does this, we'll be able to learn to live with the virus, which is going to be the most effective way out of this, barring a vaccine or an effective treatment against this, which we hope and pray will come to pass very soon. Well, that was certainly insightful and extremely educational. Thank you very much for joining us on the show, Razin. It was a great pleasure. It's been a pleasure being with you. Thanks very much for having me. After a short break, Ashwini Vedekan will be back with an update on global news. Stay tuned. We are the first credit information bureau in the South Asian region. We maintain credit information in order to facilitate credit to everyone. We at Crib do not blacklist. Loan applications are easier if your credit information is with Crib. Crib reports do not provide recommendations. We do not give our opinion. The Credit Information Bureau of Sri Lanka. We help create a credit worthy society.
Welcome back to the show, I'm Ashni Vedakan, and here's a roundup of global news. As of this week, the COVID-19's global numbers have exceeded 54 million, with the recovered number being a little over 38 million. In the US, Michigan and Washington are the latest states to introduce strict measures to try to curb the spread of the coronavirus. COVID-19 cases have now topped 11 million in the nation, with daily cases rising by more than 100,000. On average, more than 900 people a day are dying due to the virus and the overall death toll is at 246,210. However, the Trump administration struck an optimistic tone on Friday, saying it hoped to distribute 20 million doses of an approved vaccine in December and each month after that, although vaccines have yet to obtain official approval. Peru's interim president, Manuel Marino, resigned on Sunday after just a week in office, leaving the country in limbo following lawmakers' demands that he step down over two deaths during protests at the sudden ouster of his predecessor. A massive oil well fire that raged for more than five months in northeast India has been extinguished. The incident has cost Oil India 30.5 million US dollars as of late September, according to the firm's quarterly financial results released last week. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson is self-isolating after coming in contact with someone who tested positive for COVID-19. Johnson, who was admitted to intensive care in a London hospital earlier this year with the novel coronavirus, is well and has not displayed any symptoms, a spokesman for the Prime Minister said on Sunday. And in global business news, Asian stocks hit a record high on Monday as vaccine optimism and strong economic data from China and Japan outshone worries of the rising coronavirus cases, lifting just about every sector. Japan's economy has bounced back from recession with growth of 5% in the third quarter of this year. This follows the country witnessing its economy shrinking during 2020 as lockdowns hit its manufacturing sector and consumer spending. The world's third biggest economy is now displaying signs of recovery, although some analysts caution that further growth is likely to be modest. Asian economies are leading the way for a global economic recovery in what some have called a Zoom boom. This refers to the increase in demand for screens and laptops as more people work from home and use online meeting platforms such as Zoom. Meanwhile, 15 countries have formed the world's largest trading bloc, covering nearly a third of the global economy. The Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, or RCEP, comprises 10 Southeast Asian countries, as well as South Korea, China, Japan, Australia and New Zealand. This pact is seen as an extension of China's influence in the region, but the deal excludes the US, which withdrew from a rival Asia-Pacific trade pact in 2017. And finally, UK Prime Minister Boris Johnson is understood to be planning to ban the sale of new petrol and diesel cars within a decade, with reports stating that the ban will be brought forward by five years. It follows the Prime Minister moving the cut-off date from 2040 to 2035 in February. Johnson is expected to announce the measure amid a raft of new environmental policies next week. That's all we have for you this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Thank you for watching and stay safe.